Okay, so bear, bear that in mind. You know, when you're a decision maker, you don't always have all the elements to be able to, to assess what is good, what is bad. You know, it's not, it's not an easy one. These are not necessarily people who are trained as well on the topics that they have to take decisions on. So it's not easy. So we need to get input. So we'll start getting a little bit of input. I'd like to uh, welcome back uh, Martin uh, to the stage to tell us a little bit about PFAS. You know, what it is do we know and what it is do we still don't know? <laughs> Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Yes, uh, I will put a quick spotlight on PFAS now. PFAS is, yeah, is this working? Do we go for handheld? Yeah, yeah. Is this working now? No. Uh -oh. Okay, now I will put a spotlight on PFAS now. PFAS is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, a complicated chemical name. Here you can see what uh, they are. PFAS are old chemicals actually, they come from the 1950s, but the discussion about PFAS, the current discussion, started basically by this publication by Giese and Cannon in 2001 when they reported the worldwide occurrence of four of these PFAS, and two of them are highlighted here as separate chemical formulas. You see PFOS and P4. These are the two um, paradigmatic PFASs that have been investigated a lot. We see in red the key element of PFASs, which is these perfluorinated alkyl chain. An alkyl chain is a chain of carbon atoms, and all of these carbon atoms carry as much fluorine as possible. And this fluorinated part gives them these um, unique properties. They are water repellent and grease repellent. And they can be used as impregnation agents, as um, surfactants, um, uh, as lubricants or in lubricants, in ski racks, and many, many other applications, as we will see. Unfortunately, I would say the picture is very broad and diverse and also complicated because there are so many of them. There are hundreds or thousands even of PFAS on the market and there's a definition by the OECD which is, I think it makes sense, it's, it's chemically, it makes sense, but it, it, means, it implies that there are really many of them and you see how different they are. You see on the left still P4, that's the chemical we just had, and also something that is related to P4, it's called GenX. Uh, or similar, and these chemicals are, have been used in large amounts in the production of fluoropolymers, which are on the right. This is, for example, Teflon. To make Teflon, you need, or did, it used, the case was that people you had to use P4 as a production aid, and then with the processed waters, uh, a lot of P4 was released to the environment, and also of GenX and other chemicals are used for that purpose. So these two are related on the left and on the right. Then uh, at the bottom or right, there is another type of polymer where the main polymer chain is not fluorinated, but there's these red side chains that are fluorinated. And these side chain fluorinated polymers are used as impregnation agents or have been used a lot as impregnation agents. Cool. And then the last group is in the middle on the top. This is so-called F gases. These are chemicals that are used as refrigerants in heat pumps or in cooling uh, installations. And they are volatile, they are different, they are not water soluble, they go up into the air. Yeah, that's cool. But all of them, because they have that red element there, fluorine, all of them are, have share one thing, and that's their great chemical stability. They are what we call persistent. They are very persistent, and many of them do not go away at all. So they will stay for decades and centuries, and that is the core of the problem. Many of you may have seen this. This map was published earlier this year in February uh, by a consortium of journalists in Europe. Uh, the website where you can find it is uh, foreverpollution.eu. This will be here, where they describe how they approached this problem. What they did is they collected data on PFAS contamination from uh, many different sites in um, all European countries from the authorities. So these are not new data, but what's new is that the data have been harmonized, have been checked for consistency, and have been put into this interactive map. So you can click on the map and you can zoom in and find uh, each location that is um, shown here, and you see also the chemicals that have been measured at these places and the concentrations are uh, given in numbers. And it is, as you see, it's over 15,000 sites in Europe. 
And much of this um, contamination came from the use of PFAS as firefighting foams or in firefighting foams for jet fuels. If there's a fire with um, kerosene, then you need something that can extinguish that fire. And the, this was one of the big applications of PFAS. And also many other applications, industrial applications, production of fluoropolymers, they have all contributed to these contaminations. As I said, there was this consortium of European journalists from many countries, led by uh, Stéphane Aurel from Le Monde in France. And they have published this map and also published a list of more than 70 articles in most or many European languages. And you can find them down on, on the same page. So this is just the top of the page and this is further down. If you scroll down, you find the articles. And importantly, these are newspaper articles. These are not scientific articles. These are articles that are really meant to be understandable and readable by the general public. And you can find them in many European languages. So I think this is a very important effort to make this problem more visible, more tangible to people, and outline what, what, what's, what's behind all of this. this um, when it's, it sounds technical, it's complicated, but still it matters a lot to people because it's in the water, it's in the food, and it's also in people's bodies. And therefore, it is something that, people, that we should know about. And therefore, I think this initiative has been so important. There is a similar map also for the US. Um, actually, this map was already there before the European map came, and it was a bit of a model that we would have wanted to have something like this also for Europe, and it works in the same way. You find all these dots that illustrate where these contaminated sites are. So we see it's a pervasive problem of persistent chemicals. Why are they there? What, what, why, why do we have to care about them? Because they have been used in so many applications, in hundreds and more of applications of different types, of very different types. Here is a review paper or an article by Sharon Lerner in the magazine The Intercept, where she summarizes important findings from a study that we conducted in our institute. Our study is this one, but this is a technical and scientific paper with lots of technical information, and Sharon was able to condense this into a more, uh, in, a, in an article that is directed towards the general public. So if you want to take a closer look at where they are used, or they have been used for many years, you'll find that in this paper. And it's really diverse, it's many consumer products, it's skin creams and ski wax and textile impregnation and other impregnation for the surf for surfaces. It's also in, in cleaning agents. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically everywhere where impregnation is needed and also where, um, as like ski racks, where it's important that something is gliding efficiently, lubricants. In addition, they have been used in many demanding technical or industrial applications as chemicals that have powerful properties and can do a lot of things that uh, under harsh conditions in the industry. Semiconductor production, for example, and oil, uh, oil, oil uh, pumping, Fracking, fracking fluids uh, that are used to remove the oil from the rocks uh, also contain PFAS and so on. So this is the paper and then turning to, of course, the elephant in the room in a way for here is that they also have been used a lot in food packaging. And although this has been known for long and also the many companies have also made decisions to phase out PFAS in food packaging, we still find them. And this was just a paper that came out earlier just this summer where they found them in uh, drinking straws. And it says there that PFAS were found to be present in almost all types of straws except for those made of stainless steel. PFAS were more frequently detected in plant-based materials such as paper and bamboo. The presence of PFAS in plant-based straws shows that they are not necessarily biodegradable and that the use of such straws potentially contributes to human and environmental you know, exposure to PFAS, I would say. And um, this is, of course, not what people would expect if they use a paper straw and try to avoid plastics, and then they end up with this. Similar here, this is uh, from a German report where they investigated uh, different single-use food bowls uh, made from sugarcane. And all of these ones, you see this on the right, uh, the right column is TOF, that's total organic fluorine, 
So not specific PFAS, but just the sum in a way of all of them. And you see how high these concentrations are. So this shows this is not just contamination and carry over from something from somewhere else. This is really intentionally added PFAS to these materials to make them more water and grease resistant, of course, because when um, sugar cane may, may, be, may take up the water and then you have a, a, a leaking um, bowl. And that's, of course, what they want to avoid. And then that's why then they add PFAS. But of course, that's gets exactly the opposite of what we want to, to accomplish. We don't want to use new materials that then are made um, toxic and problematic by, by the addition of, of chemicals that are not sustainable at all. In a way, we may say that PFAS are the most unsustainable chemicals ever because they don't go away. So they are exactly the opposite of something that would disappear and leave no footprint. They leave a huge footprint, a uh, forever footprint. Also, FPF is working on PFAS. This is from a paper that has been just submitted or is still under review. And you see that here in the extra, uh, abstract, um, the team uh, mentions what they have done. They looked at the FCC or they used the FCC MyGix database, which is a database that contains chemicals that have been found in food contact materials and have been deter uh, confirmed to even also move out of these materials. And it says that 68 PFASs have been identified in various food contact materials by targeted and untargeted analysis, including paper, plastic, and coated metal. 87% of these PFASs belong to the perfluorocarboxylic acids and fluorotelomer-based compounds. Trends in the chain length demonstrate that long-chain perfluoroalkyl acids continue to be found despite years of global efforts to reduce the use of these substances. Again, now why, so the question was, why are they there? And now why are we concerned? And they, we are concerned, of course, because they are toxic and they cause toxic impacts on people. For example, they affect um, fertility in men by reducing the sperm count, as we have heard earlier from Jane, that this is one of the big concerns that um, many people show these um, reproductive diseases or disorders. They do many more things. This is again a nice overview by Sharon Lerner in The Intercept. Sharon Lerner has published many papers about PFAS in The Intercept, and this is a very important transmission of the scientific data into the public. Again, of course, there are scientific papers, for example, this one, which is a very nice overview of many of the toxic effects that PFAS can cause. They um, damage livers and kidneys, and they affect the thyroid, thyroid system, they affect the um, lipid metabolism, they reduce the birth weight of, of the newborns, they cause also, as we said, um, they reduce the sperm count and they also lead to a, a reduced immune response after vaccinations. So a wide range of different effect, effects in, in people and that's why we are so concerned and why it is necessary, I would say, that they have to disappear from as many applications as possible. That's then the last step in all of this, because there have been, has been a lot of effort to try to address this problem and to try to remove PFAS from many applications. This is this famous restriction proposal on PFAS as a class on all of them in the EU. There is, this is a website for, uh, of the European Chemicals Agency, ECHA, where you see what, what's going on currently and you see at the bottom just on Monday night, the consultation period closed, and it says that it was um, 5,600 comments have been received by ECHA on the restriction proposal. And now uh, the committees of ECHA have to make sense of all of that and then form an opinion, and then it will move on to the European Commission to finally make, I think, a plan and decision on what, what's coming as the final version of this regulation. What we can see already is that the chemical industry, the fluorine chemical industry, um, has, is moving. They're moving away from many or all of these consumer applications of PFAS. They even say, openly say, we have heard that from representatives of the industry, they say that nobody really needs these consumer applications, impregnation agents and all that, that's not really needed. Uh, which is interesting to hear from the companies who make them. The two large groups that are the biggest ones in terms of just market volume and also revenue is the fluoropolymers, such as Teflon, and these F-gases. And this is where the big battles will probably be, to what extent these chemicals can be removed or 
if they will be even left out of the, um, the restriction proposal to some extent. So that's where we are moving now, that this is a difficult discussion about fluoropolymers and all the many different applications and CF gases. One important point is that some people say there will, no be, not be, or there will be no energy transition without these materials because they are used in heat pumps, the F gases, and fluoropolymers are used in batteries, for example. But now the big but, as the last slide here is, there are alternatives to all of this. This is an editorial I was invited to write for the journal Science, and as you can see from the title, the main message is that we should leave PFAS behind. PFAS are chemistry of the past, and for many of the hundreds and thousands of applications of PFAS, there are alternatives. Not for all of them, but for many of them. And it's important to see that PFAS really are a stumbling block to innovation, and it's important to um, remove that stumbling block and foster the development of new alternatives or just the um, introduction to the market, because many of them already exist, and many of them have been on the market for long. So it's a myth that our modern life and our future depends on PFAS. This is just not the case. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Do we have a question for Martin on PFAS, the spotlight that he put? Yeah, we can take one. We have time for one. I don't know, do we have a... A quick microphone, maybe? Or you can maybe try... No, you can't speak into this one. That would be a bit tricky. It's coming. We have time for one. It's coming. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Um, just a quick question. You've been talking about the European regulation for PFAS. What's happening in the United States? I, I'm not really the person to answer this in detail. It's complicated. It's a lot. Uh, important is that there are different states that have their independent or their own plans and have imp implemented already some regulation on PFAS, but it's of course very different across states in the United States. And also the federal government has um, something, many things underway. The agencies, US EPA, is working on many aspects, but uh, I cannot give a quick summary here. Because the, the biggest producers, uh, DuPont and 3M, uh, are the ones that are behind much of the production of PFAS, I understand. Yeah, but also other companies, in, also in Europe, Solvay, for example, and the, the Japanese companies, oh, that it's, a, it's a global business. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Martin, to have shed that spotlight on, on PFAS. <laughs>